<laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. This is the biggest assembly, I guess, that we've had for one of these uh, joint meetings. So thank you very much for being here. I'm Joan Peck, Mayor of Longmont, and uh, we're going to start with introductions, so I will hand it off to your superintendent, and we'll go around that way, if you don't mind. All right, thank you. I'm Don Haddad, superintendent for St. Ray. Carol Dominguez, city manager. Shakita Yarbrough, city council. Johnny Torres, is the superintendent of student services. Aaron Rodriguez, city council. Diane Lauer, chief academic officer. Diane Chris, city council. Dina Perfetti Dini, area assistant superintendent with St. Ray. Jim Berthold, vice president of the school board. Brian Switzler, executive director of construction and maintenance for St. Ray. Susie Adalgo Faring, uh, mayor pro tem, city of Longmont. Laura Hess, assistant superintendent of special ed. Tim O'Neill, general counsel for St. Ray. Matt Rennick, District Architect for St. Brent. Craig Feith, Chief Financial Officer for St. Brent. Sandy Seeger, City Manager's Office, City of Longmont. Jocelyn Gilligan, um, Board Member and Treasurer. Jody Marsh, Assistant City Manager. Kale Charles, Assistant Superintendent, Assistant Curriculum and Instruction. Brian Langler, Assistant Superintendent of Operations. Zach Artis, on the Public Safety Chief for the City of Longmont. Jackie Capuchin, Deputy Superintendent for St. Brent. Karen Radman, President, Board of Education. And the back area, we have three. Jeff Friesner, Director of Recreation and Culture. Uh, John Solomon, Director of the Longmont Public Library. Christina Pacheco, Human Services Director, City of Longmont. Oh. Great. Right. Some of our um, Division Manager, Children, Needs, and Families. Oh, I did you see her sitting back there. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. We've got a pretty good crowd of uh, very interesting people. So <laughs> we all have an agenda. I think the way we're going to go through that is uh, each topic, it looks like the first bullet points, all those bullet points are going to be handed off to our superintendent. But after each subject, uh, we'll have a Q&A. And uh, I think each person has about three minutes for their questions. Um, and if Karen doesn't mind, she can be on time. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to our superintendent, Don Haddad. Well, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that, and uh, thank you for all being here. I'll give you a brief update about our potential bond, and I say potential because ultimately it will be a decision made in August by the Board of Education, our recommendation, based on feedback from our community, and we've held several meetings. We also convened a task force that looked at the specifics of the bond, what we would be building, where it would be built in terms of each project, and then the cost. And so uh, we had strong support to move forward. What we're looking at in a bond is three major areas. One is to accommodate growth. We're at 33, approximately 1,000 students right now and 60 schools. And our ultimate build-out plan is for 65 to 70,000 students. And so each year we're going to see growth, and it's important that we plan and we move forward with that planning so that we're not on the back end trying to play catch up. And so what this bond will do, number one, is provide additional schools to accommodate the growth. There will be an elementary school in Longmont. There will be an elementary school in Erie. There will be a K-8 in Mead. There will be a high school out on the east side of our district that will serve with open enrollment. It could potentially serve all areas, but primarily it will serve our Mead, Frederick, Firestone, Dacono area out in, in an Erie as well. And then the fifth will be a career and tech ed center similar to the one that we have here in Longmont. We have a long waiting list now in Longmont for students to get their two-year certificates and to participate in role in welding and electronics and machining and automotive technology and culinary arts and all of those programs, nursing, etc. And so another facility, because our numbers are exploding, will create lots more space here in Longmont for a lot of our students, and it will create space in the eastern side of our district, and it will stop all of the busing from one side of the district to the other. It will stop interfering with students' schedules as much, and again, it will accommodate literally thousands of additional students with a very lucrative opportunity to earn their two-year certificates and then go into the workforce making sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year. And so that's something that we're very excited about. The bond will also accommodate the renovation of our buildings 
and you know about deferred maintenance. If we defer maintenance any longer, the costs will escalate. And so we need to make sure that our rough, roofs are repaired, our walls, our floors, doors, carpets, all of that stuff. And now is the time to do that because the cost will fit within what we can make it cost and still not raise people's taxes. And I'll explain that to you in just a second. And then the third area is safety. We need to make sure that our fire alarm systems are up to date and all of the camera systems and the double vestibule doors and all of the things that keep our students, teachers, and visitors safe in our buildings. And you can imagine when you start looking at 60 schools and you start looking at buildings such as this one, there's just a lot that you need to keep up with. And so right now, we can go for a bond that accommodates the things that I've just mentioned, and we can do so without raising taxes. And we know that we can do that this time around. We don't know if we can do it out in the future because of the escalating costs of inflation and deferred maintenance and all of those things, and the cost of construction. Because I don't know, Brian can probably explain. I remember when a high school would cost something like $50 million. Now a high school is well over $100 million. And that's just the nature of rising costs. So because our assessed valuation has increased significantly within our 411 square miles, we don't have to raise taxes on an annual basis in order to accommodate the dollar amount that we've selected. And we have deliberately selected a dollar amount that will not trigger that increase. And that's why it's important that we go in 20 24 this fall, because if we push it out another year, the costs will simply escalate. And safety issues will continue to rise and those types of things. The other thing is we have paid down uh, a good part of our debt earlier than we were required to. And so we've saved, basically, taxpayers over $80 million in terms of costs that we would have otherwise incurred. So between paying down debt early, increased assessed valuation, we're able to go for this bond, which will take the entire St. Brain Valley school system out into the next decade and not increase people's taxes. Now, people have said, well, my taxes went up. And that may very well have been true because the assessed valuation on your home went up. But that's not something we control. This bond will not increase taxes. The tax increase that you've already experienced has nothing to do with this bond or school system. The other thing that I think is important for people to know is we have lowered the taxes by 1.147 mills. And Greg, you might, if anybody has questions, we can both respond to it. But that took effect this spring. So we not only are going to be able to go for a bond without raising taxes, we actually made the decision to lower the taxes. And that has already been done. And so that's a very unique place for a school system to be in. And we're very grateful to our community and others for having put us in this position. So that's the long and short of the bond. And we have done a couple of pollings. One was with an outside consulting group, and it polled very favorably. And then most recently, we sent a mailing out to all of our taxpayers, whether they have students in our schools or not, and invited them to respond. And I know that uh, from having talked to the committee that's working on this, that the responses are coming in very, very positive. I also have been out doing a number of presentations, answering questions, and in each instance, the response has been very favorable. People ask good questions, and the responses are there. And when somebody says, well, what, what happens if what you're telling us changes? And I said, well, it can't, because the ballot language is going to be legal language that's on the ballot. And we don't have the ability <clears throat> to deviate from what that ballot language is going to be. So what we're telling you is a fact, and it will be borne out in the ballot language. And Greg is going to kind of manage and be our liaison to the four counties, Boulder, Weld, Broomfield, and Larimer, as we put this on the ballot if our board makes that decision in August. OK, thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Superintendent on the board? I have one. So the dollar amount that you're that you're projecting to to go forward with, 
is fully within the realm of any adjustments that might have to be made after the passage of SB 233? Yeah, you know, it's. I'll have Greg respond a little bit to it, but you know, we don't uh, we don't have control over what happens with outside ballot initiatives and things along those lines. But what we do know is that this will not increase the taxes. And Greg, I don't know if you want to respond. At yeah, all. I, I think it, we can definitely still issue that amount of bonds. Um, it's just a matter of how we stagger them and, the, and how how we load them into the next power bond we decide to do, whether that's 15 years, 25 years, whatever. So we can definitely fit within the ballot language with how we structure our bonds. And the other thing I would tell you is, and I think you already know this, but this mechanism is the only way that a school district can go to build new schools and infrastructure. And so it's not like we can say, well, we're not going to go for a bond and we're going to put all the students on the roof or we're going to tell students you can't go to school. So we don't have the luxury of not building these buildings, and yet we now have this moment in time where we can do it and not put that additional burden on taxpayers, and as I said, we're actually lowering their taxes. The other thing I will tell you, uh, because your question prompted a thought, when school districts go for bonds, they almost always go for a mill levy override simultaneously because you build with the bonds and then you staff with the mill levy override. And because our district's growing and because our general fund and our other budgets are so strong, we don't need to go for a mill levy override. So that's another way of saying to the community, we're doing everything we can to not put an additional burden. And as you look at what students and their families benefit from, we have five, and I'll get into this a little later, five P-TECH programs where we have hundreds of students students from lower socioeconomic families, first generation students that are getting a two-year associate degree at no cost to the student. We have been providing free preschool and full day kindergarten for our students for 15 years, long before anybody else in Colorado decided that it was a good idea. And you look at all of the ways in which families are saving thousands of dollars in tuition, because of the concurrent enrollment courses, they can earn their freshman year in college before they walk out the door to the tune of twenty to thirty thousand dollars. And then when you look at these two year certificates where kids can get these certificates and our workforce is in desperate need of these types of workers and they can earn these and move on into the workforce making tens of thousands of dollars without these huge amounts of debt. So this is uh, probably one of the best investments and the best returns on an investment that a community <coughs> can ever see, regardless of the entity. Any other questions? Seeing none, our next uh, agenda item then is partnerships, which is going to be, again, Superintendent Haddad. No, I appreciate it. And, and I know we've been working closely with Harold on a couple of these things, but uh, the trade skills and the apprenticeship opportunities, we have currently the Career and Tech Ed Center with all of those programs that I mentioned, and the numbers there are exploding. And we actually have the state champion welder, the automotive technology state champions, and the culinary art state champions. And we are now seeing in that school a graduation rate of nearly 90%. And so you're seeing all these students move through and get their diploma and their certificates, and again, being launched into these very lucrative careers. The other thing is, is we are partnering with CareerWise on a Northern Colorado apprenticeship hub, and we had an opportunity to go to Switzerland with the governor's office and study their apprenticeship program because it's the best in the world. And we are doing that now. We have apprenticeship programs right now, and I know Dina can talk a little bit about this, but in our teaching and in a number of our technology areas and so we are already engaged deeply with apprenticeships we're also working with the business community and with the governor's office who has made changes working with human resources so that the businesses and the corporations can begin to accommodate our high school students doing these types of apprenticeships and then going right into the workforce in that same place where they are doing the work so internships, apprenticeships, trade schools, we are, I 
have no problem saying this, we are absolutely leading the state and beyond in this arena. And we're seeing, and that's one of the reasons why we're building out another career in Tech Ed Center and a Northern Colorado apprenticeship hub because of all of these things. We were able to win a $7 million grant, the Opportunity Now grant, and that's kicked in and done some work with our PTEACH apprenticeships. So a lot of, a lot of momentum in this area. Great. Um, I was wondering, Harold, do you want to give a little bit on our apprenticeship intern program as well as the swimming uh, conversations that you're having with the superintendent? Yeah, well, so, I'll so Don and I on the swimming side are talking. I know uh, different groups are looking for additional lane space, and so we're trying to work with them to see how between what we have in capacity and what the school district can do in terms of funding that there's some opportunities for some of these groups and then obviously talking at a larger level about what does swimming look like in the future. Uh, in terms of the um, internship program that we have, we have a few different internship programs that we're doing. One is specifically um, that we did last year with Front Range, um, and I know Sandy's here. Sandy's the one that's doing most of the internship work. So I'm going to let Sandy talk a little bit about that. You want to talk about I'm, I'm trying to catch attendance also. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> wandering around. Wow, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are you talking about the one with Front Range? Yeah, so okay. we, we've done one with Front Range. Okay. I know we brought students in from the school district on a number of occasions. They helped us roll out. Um, iPhones one year, we've had school district students come in and work on our security system. Of course, our latest collaboration is a drum show on the 4th of July. Yes. Yeah. Center, folks, so that's really wonderful. So we do have two internship programs. One is considered a city council internship program where they get to have the opportunity to work with city council and with departments on a project over the summer. Um, that's a nexus between uh, students at Front Range Community College that are also members of the Chamber Student Network, so it's a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce as well as with Front Range Community College. And then uh, those students get to come in and spend the summer um, working in a specific department on something that they're interested in, so we kind of tailor those internships to them. Um, the second internship is, as you all are very familiar with, is the PTEC program. Uh, so this is our second year of PTEC students coming in. Um, and so we are partnered with Longmont High School um, talking about business, different kinds of businesses and careers. So we, we welcomed our first 30 students last year. So our second 30 students, their tours next week. And so um, it's very exciting to get to know them and to know them as mentors from the city. And then, of course, as you know, they work their way through and, and, and their high school career with an internship with us and then a two-year degree from the PTEC program. So we're really excited. We're just at the beginning of that, but there's, there's a lot of interest and energy around mentoring those students. Uh, we're starting to have some conversations with our operational divisions, and so when I talk about that, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, uh, Longmont has our own electric utility. Obviously, we do broadband, water, wastewater, um, and, and trying to really look at how we can take this concept of the internship program and move it into our operational divisions. Um, specifically, when we look um, in terms of hiring pools um, for Longmont Power, um, seeing people move into the, the lines person world um, and working in that field is something that we've struggled with recently in trying to create a pipeline for those individuals that can move in through the system. And um, you know, the salaries are pretty high in, in the electric industry right now. Probably um, once you get through the apprenticeship program, over $100,000. Um, we're seeing similar things within our water and wastewater operations in terms of, and, and our operational departments in the field in terms of what they need to do and, you know, working within technology. So we're trying to grasp uh, what we can do on the operational side of the house to, to look at additional internship opportunities and really starting at, at you know, preferably starting at the middle school level and talking to folks about the opportunities that exist in these fields. Um, so, but it's a little bit different because we're trying to wrap our brains around the safety aspects um, because a lot of this, there's a lot of safety issues that we have to take into consideration. 
Um, so we're um, continuing to evaluate that piece as well. And I know we've had um, folks from your innovation center work with our water department in underwater RMBs and working those with some of our um, um, small reservoirs that we have in the community. And um, yes, earlier this week we were talking about how we manage, uh, how we look at uh, spring runoff and potential for flood and getting into more in depth in terms of the drone concept and utilizing LIDAR and some other components and talked about how could we potentially involve the school district in that, um, that process. So a lot of things that we're noodling around right now. Dana, do you want to share anything about apprenticeships? And yeah, we have apprenticeships going in our PTEACH program, so we are the business provider for that since we are an organization of teachers. We're an organization of much more than that, but we have lots of teachers to um, mentor people. We also have um, apprenticeships, which is a two to three year commitment of an organization to mentor and employ um, students. We have that also in our district technology services department. We're looking at expanding that into our P-TECs, so we have the five P-TECs, including P-TEACH, and looking at all of our P-TECH students um, receive an internship in that experience, but sometimes students could have an opportunity for a two to three year apprenticeship experience, which is a more um, developed um, on-ramp into a company, and so we're looking at that. And then Don mentioned the St. Brain Apprenticeship Hub as well. We now have two full-time staff who will be with us. Um, they've, they've started at the end of this year and they'll continue next year, and their sole work will be to make sure that um, our students are prepared for internships and we match them to business communities. We make sure that we do an assessment of the safety of that um, employment opportunity. We set goals between the employer and our students, and we make sure that that's a great experience for both the employer and our students. And we're hoping to get 50 to 60 internships per internship coordinator, and so we're thinking, you know, 100 to 120 new internship and apprenticeship opportunities um, as we start this apprenticeship hub, and that gives us a place to point students to and parents to if their student wants an internship. We can have them call the apprenticeship hub, get get connected with one of our internship coordinators and then we can work with one of our eight comprehensive high schools or the innovation center we can connect them to the right career path um, in, in really any of our high schools or our career centers so it's exciting um uh, so yeah. thank you and um, this might be directed more towards you dina um, so which companies, businesses, and professions have um, you already connected students with? Well, there are probably 130 just at CETC. Okay, so, on so on different and businesses yeah. that they've been yeah. in touch with. And then what particular trades, I mean, so really what I'm getting at is, you know, I've heard from different plumbing companies mm -hmm. and um, um, air airline, you know, looking at airline oh, mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that in conversations with folks at the airport was that we have an aging <coughs> population of people leaving that profession just because they've been, you know, they're at age to retire and they're really not getting new people coming yeah. in. So there's yeah. a growing interest. So, um, yeah. you know, so kind of expanding some of those and pl plumbing is another profession. Yeah. 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 Plumber, yeah. Yeah. Kind of experience yeah. that um, decline mm -hmm. in our who's coming in. It's you see a lot of old cars. <laughs> so, so like, Susie, as we're, we build, in. <laughs> as we're building out apprenticeships, uh -huh. one thing we are bumping up against is just the age requirements that many companies have uh -huh. um, in working with um, high school students. So we we have some work to do, and our businesses have some work to do yeah. in that space. Um, many of their HR policies do not allow for students under the age of 18. Many do. Uh -huh. um, they're a little more difficult to find. Um, but one thing that we can use lots of help with yes. is um, helping um, businesses and companies understand the maturity level of our students mm -hmm. because some of our students really do amazing things yeah. and, and have great skill sets and they're ready to go. Um, I think sometimes there's a perception that because they're under the age of 18 and 
Dina um, has worked with a group of folks all year to, really the last couple of years, to really make sure that these handoffs to these companies between our students is done really well. That our students know what to expect, that the company knows what to expect, and that we, mod we don't just give them our kids and say good luck. We do a lot of monitoring, making sure they're showing up on time, that our students have meaningful work to do, that they're not just sweeping floors, which is also meaningful, but that they, they are working in the area that they're specified to work in. Um, you know, that they're not filing paperwork all day, but that, that they really have good, meaningful work. And so we do, we have work to do. We hear a lot of companies saying they need talent, they need, mm -hmm. they, we have an aging population, they need the workers, and yet their own policies create barriers for bringing in internships and apprenticeships. Yeah, Susie, one of the things I'll tell you, we have a very, we have a solid aviation program right now where a number of our students are earning their pilot's license. Uh -huh. We're also going to be building out the innovation center. It's 50,000 square feet. Part of the bond will be to double that because of the numbers of students who will be entering into that particular arena and others. We also will have construction management at the new career and tech ed center, which encompasses electricians, plumbers, machinists, all of those types of things. We've got a lot of activity there. I sit on the Bell Commission, which is a commission appointed by the governor, and it looks at the business connections around this issue. And we are looking at pushing forward legislation to enable city councils and local leaders and businesses and corporations to join in the effort for apprenticeships. Because right now, our biggest impediment is the, the infrastructure at the city and county levels. We have the kids ready to go, and they are going in, in ways that we've actually provided them. But as Jackie said, what we're bumping up against is some of the bureaucracies at the local level. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're working at the state level uh, through the governor's office and through this commission to try to get legislation so that we don't find these barriers. Yeah. And I know we have an upcoming, uh, was, was it with our state legislators? Yes, yeah, that's coming up. So that's something that we can add to the, to the agenda to discuss. As well as, you know, and this is perfect because this is a great opportunity for us to partner you know, we are meeting with our state legislators and look at policy, and even, you know, helping to come up with language that Well, and there are probably a number barriers. of apprenticeships and internships that could happen right in city government. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's HR or construction or any of those types of things, because we have a number of students that would love to do internships and apprenticeships in the city of Longmont. Mm -hmm. And not just Longmont, but yeah. Frederick and Firestone and all of these other places. So. Um, those would be wonderful opportunities. I also sit on the board of directors for the Colorado Business Roundtable, mm -hmm. and we are advocating for large corporations and businesses to begin to open those gates for the apprenticeships and the internships to take place in some of the largest companies and corporations in, in Colorado. And then uh, we work with the Chambers of Commerce. You know, we have five Chambers of Commerce in our particular school district. And so asking them to become active in working with their businesses to open the door for apprenticeships and internships for our students. Mm -hmm. And that whole workforce pipeline is dependent on it. So yeah. we're excited about that. And Don, I, you know, I have an example. To, um, today I received an email from somebody in central administration that said three of our four um, partners for one of our p -techs has pulled out of summer internships this summer. Um, that they can't accommodate our students for summer internships. And this is a very um, up-and-coming area. It's cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Every business is saying they need professional hackers. They need cybersecurity mm -hmm. experts. And yet, um, Three of the four of our partners pulled out of offering summer internships for us. Explain so, why. So, um, St. Brain is going to offer those internships as much as possible for our own tech department. Um, but we have to be careful that we have the capacity to manage that number yeah. of students. Yeah. Um, do they explain why they pulled out? Uh, yeah, some of it is resource. Um, you know, I think 
what's uh, frustrating to hear sometimes is that, um, you know, we, we businesses offer relocation packages to import talent, and yet they don't have the resources to actually pay for it, paid internships or apprenticeships. So it's, it's kind of that proactive approach on the front end mm -hmm. um, and prioritizing that. Um, so we've heard, we've heard some of that. Yeah, and I think, you know, knowing those reasons, we can kind of look at for solutions, especially since a lot of them ask, you know, for contracts with the city and there's, they want partnership with the city. Well, you know, we're looking at housing and meeting the needs of our current population. And then, you know, rather than businesses looking to prioritize and bringing in outside people, really, how can we grow our own? That's right. Industries. And I think the other that we hear is that they don't have the, they don't have the staff that want to supervise an intern. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, come to the other. Yes. Um, Sandy, couldn't we, I know last year we had a, a NIWAT student uh, that was a part of the internship. Is there a way we can accept so many students, high school students for the summer program and so many front range students for, for the program to make sure that we can Oh, you're smiling. What is that? I'm smiling because it's your program. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we, we started it as a as a college kind of you know um, program to be able to work with the Chamber of Commerce, but certainly you could expand that opportunity to, to high school students. And and we did have one that was a high school student taking classes at Front Range, um, and was part of the Chamber Student Network. So I feel like if we're if we're able to kind of work with the Chamber. Um, the design is completely up to you all. So that's something um, we can work on and see what that looks like, you know, uh, moving forward, especially knowing that you are getting those students ready to be in that type of environment. Um, it's a really good program. So it's a pilot program. This is our second year, and so we have other municipalities who are looking at this program as well. So I would love to, um, for us to connect together and have our high school students to participate as well as our front range students. So I know, depending on the capacity of the staff and everything, of how many uh, students that we'll be able to take on. Mm -hmm. So, and then also I just have the question about, what about LEDP? What about talking to them about making sure the businesses that they talk to about apprenticeship uh, programs as well? Well, the, the mayor and I both sit here on the board, and we have had those conversations. We actually are funding, what's that biopharmaceutical group that's coming out that we contributed some dollars to that they're going to bring employment in? Um, but we have been working with here in Boston. Do you know the group? Is one of Nelson? What's that? It's a biopharma, a state biopharma association, or something. Yeah, right. And a number of jobs that would include some of the apprenticeships sure. and internships. But that particular group, they've been very, very receptive. Yeah. I think part of it is, you know, A, when you talk about legislation, is addressing some of the insurance issues because yes. the nature of the work, the insurance companies actually can slide in and they can be the impediment. Yeah. They are. And uh, so that's a piece that our legislative fix. I think in terms of like the, the cybersecurity piece, um, I think if we know there's needs and there's gaps, let us know because we have folks not only in our ATS department but in our next slide department in turn that work with cybersecurity. So you know we could potentially step in. That's outstanding. I'm going to have Brandon Schaefer reach out to you. Okay. He's trying to find internships for. Yeah students in our P Tech program. And he would he would love to have okay. some of those. And I think slots. and I think generally when we look organizationally, whether it's HR or some of these other issues, um, we're pretty unique and I think there's probably very little that we do in our organization. I mean whether it's finance, business, HR, librarians, recreation specialists labs, I mean, we have a pretty wide breadth in, ter in terms of what we do. So I think if we just kind of can see the needs and then we can work with some of our, our operating groups, um, we can potentially fill some of those gaps from an operational perspective. That's outstanding. Thank you so much. 
Right. And I do have one last question. Um, Don, when you uh, came to council and presented to us, I, if memory serves me right, we had a question about swimming pools, swimming facilities, and you had just explained as to, to me as to why they could not be open to the public. So could you uh, address that? Yeah. We would, as a school district, relinquish our governmental immunity for liability if we opened that up outside of our own personnel and students, etc. If we were in the future to partner with the city on a swimming pool, then there's a way around that loss of governmental immunity. And so that's one option. The other option that we have that we're exploring, I've been meeting with Harold, is to take the existing pools in Longmont and see if there are any lanes that are available that we as a school district would pay to open up those lanes for students we're working with, one of the local clubs, uh, Red Fin, I think Tails. it's Red Fin. Yeah. Red Tail. And, and uh, we've had some really positive meetings, and Harold was giving me an update there, that that would enable uh, a number of students to have access to uh, the swimming pools and things along those lines. We're also, at some point, and I know this would be outside of Longmont, but we're also looking at some point to build another swimming pool on the east side of the district. And so that would necessarily help with this particular issue that we're talking about, but it would help for people in general, students, because as we continue to grow, more and more of our students will be able to use our pools, which could take some of the pressure off of the pools that are being used in long run, which could then open up more space for the public, those types of things. So there's a lot of opportunity there, and it's, it's at this point looking pretty pretty optimistic and pretty positive. So. Great, thank you. you so our next uh, item is the community safety and mental health. Um, is there someone in particular that you would like to address this on your Yeah, yeah. I can start, and then I'll you know ask Johnny and others that Laura that work very closely with this, but. But I will start with some of the things, you know, just from a uh, infrastructure standpoint, we have an amazing relationship with the Longmont Police Department and all of our police departments across the system, whether it's Frederick or Firestone or Daytona or Longmont, you know, Boulder County Sheriff's Meade, et cetera. And they work in a very positive way with our students. And they also have that connection because our students have a lot of connections to the community. So as our SROs hear things in the schools, it gives them information that's helpful in the communities as well. We also have very talented counselors, preschool all the way through grade 14. And in the last couple of years, we've added an additional 19 counselors. Actually, it's a little bit more because we've received some additional grants but we have bolstered our counseling department significantly. We also have interventionists, which is a unique position to St. Brain, and they work in the capacity of similar to a counselor, just a little bit different, but they're also there. We have school psychologists, we have social workers, and we have our teachers that work very closely with our students in support, along with our nursing staff, and our nursing staff is very, very talented. And so a lot of infrastructure around personnel. We also have K through 12, our required social and emotional learning in each of our schools with things and visions and habits of mind and then sources of strength. And so all of our teachers get to get trained in those areas and our students get exposed to that information. We also have partnered a little bit with, uh, with Longmont with some of the gang activity with uh, GRIP, and we used to have a very tight connection there, and it's been, uh, we've just begun to try to reestablish and decide which schools and what that programming will look like. Because we have to be very careful before we come into a school and start talking to elementary school kids about gangs. Mm -hmm. Because we want to make sure that, one, they don't get scared, and two, their parents don't find out what's my kid talking to somebody, who are they talking about? 
So it's not as simple as just, yeah, come on in and open the doors. We used to work with uh, Louis, Louis, yeah, very closely, and he did some excellent work. So there's there are opportunities there to partner as well. I will tell you this about um, safety. We used to have a participation rate after school of about 55% of our students. We're all up near 80%, and that's in athletics and the music program and the after school programs, and that's K through 12. And so as kids are involved in our after school programming where we provide food and we provide transportation and we provide academics and we provide robotics and we provide all of those things at no cost to the students, they're now having opportunities to engage in these activities where they're not necessarily just out the door at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And that, when you, when you talk about you know, crossing over into the mental health arena, one of the things that I know at least when we're talking about school-age children, is one, we have to distinguish between what is a hard day and what is a mental health issue. And those two things can be very different. And what I always caution our staff and our students and our everybody about is let's not make every challenge a mental health issue. Because when we do that, and we're not able to direct our resources effectively to kids who actually struggle with a real mental health issue. And one of the things that I have noticed over time is that mental health is a go-to term for anybody who's struggling. And I think we have to be careful of that. When it really hits its crescendo is when somebody says to me, we need a snow day for mental health. And it's like you just got done with a two-week vacation and you've been in school for two days since the winter break, and now you're telling me you need a mental health day because it's snowing. That's a very dangerous precedent when we start attaching that term to every single time somebody wants some time off. So that's one thing. So we're very focused because what we know in St. Brain is that a mental health issue is a very, very serious issue that requires lots of resources and lots of support. We don't want to diminish that by calling everything a mental health issue. But you've heard about the ways in which we're addressing it, and we're seeing results. Our discipline <coughs> rates are way down, and our graduation rates are way up, and our dropout rate is at 0 0.6. Our graduation rate on time is at 93.3%. And we look at the preliminary numbers for next year, and it looks like it might go over 94%. And so those are all signs of kids, while they're still being challenged, they're doing some really good things. On the flip side of that coin, we have some students and some adults that are struggling mightily with mental health issues. And there are probably a lot of reasons for that. Some can be, it's just something that you've inherited. Some can be challenges that are going on at home. Some can be challenges that are going on in school. I know that when we went through the pandemic, I was very vocal with our county health departments, telling them that you cannot continue to isolate students for two and a half years when the data does not suggest that it's necessary, and not expect a massive backlash when you isolate children from all of their support systems. And if there's one thing we learned through the pandemic is that the best place for them to be is in school. And we struggled mightily in this district when we saw policy that bars could stay open till 10 o'clock at night, church services could continue, people could go to the rec centers, people could gather outside on the streets to express their discontent with whatever was going on politically, and our children were not allowed to go to school. And our constant message fell on deaf ears. And so when we talk about mental health, we all have to own that responsibility, starting with parents, starting with our city officials, starting with our school district. And it is a full-time job because we have some kids that are struggling mightily. And unfortunately, some of those struggles were inflicted on them by policies that were ill-conceived. 
Thank you. Before we have open that up for questions, uh, and Harold, do you want to tell what the city is doing as far as mental health? Because um, I feel that we've made great strides. And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing a lot, actually. Um, I think the nature of the populations that we deal with are distinctly different uh, from each other in terms of the challenges that we face. Um, on an ongoing basis. Um, I think when we look generally, and this is community-wide, we would say probably the most significant issues, and Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, that we deal with in terms of call volume and, and challenges um, are mental health substance abuse issues. Um, and so when we, we look at what we're doing, um, one of the things that we did is we're creating uh, we're working out of a center of excellence model organizationally, so we're creating a, a mental health center of excellence because we have multiple divisions that are working on mental health issues. Um, and our, it, it'll touch housing when we get to the housing conversation. Uh, so, you know, we start with our, our youth center that is, is working on, on the mental health side. It also ties into the intervention programs that we're running through our re rewind program, which is really trying to uh, kids that would normally go into the justice system, we're taking them out and then running through the rewind program to avoid that. Um, you know, long term impact. So the, the youth center is part of this. Uh, from the public safety standpoint, um, we have our lead core teams that are working on that in terms of immediate response and when we get the calls for service and Zach can go into more detail on it and then uh, our senior services department is really engaged in, in, in mental health services to our community. If, if we've seen anything I think I can clearly state that the issues that we're seeing in our older adults is just as significant as what we're seeing in our, in our other populations. Uh, that we're serving on a regular basis and then connected to housing um, in, in all of these areas we've expanded staffing over the last few years um, this year we uh, it's connected to housing but it's going to support the broader initiative is we're bringing on three additional clinicians um, to um, we'll work more globally with um, housing but also with all of the groups we talked about and then one uh, we're putting uh, specifically to the Suites property, which is a housing authority. So if you all don't know, the city of Longmont took um, operational control uh, of the Longmont Housing Authority. Um, and so I'm sitting in that role as the executive director, and so we begin, we, we've begun melding our operations together. Um, the Suites is um, 85 units of permanent supportive housing. And so when you talk about that, permanent supportive housing is really where you're moving people from uh, homelessness into the first stage of being housed. And um, we clearly know, that, and, and the data is showing this, is that the struggles that the individuals that live, live in that facility are real. And uh, so we're bringing a clinician that will work specifically at the suite's property. In addition to that, we're partnering with the Recovery Cafe because associated with both of these, substance abuse tends to be pretty common. And so the Recovery Cafe is beginning to work with the residents of the suites in terms of moving through and maintaining, either moving through the recovery process or maintaining uh, recovery. And, and it's more than just substance abuse. Uh, we see all forms of trauma with the individuals that move into, the, into this facility. So. Um, when, when we say recovery, it's a broad base of recovery in terms of what people are challenged with. Um, and so the Center of Excellence is really combining all of these different work groups that work with different populations so that they can work simultaneous, simultaneously with each other in terms of how we support it. One of the things that we're doing, um, we worked on a, pro a project called Enabling Caring Communities. And what it's doing is really bringing in a software system that actually um, allows us to communicate more effectively with each other in terms of the people that we're dealing with in the community. Being cognizant of all of the privacy issues that we have in play, because every one of these groups have their own restrictions in terms of what they can and can't share, 
But at its most basic level, what it would mean is that if somebody walks into my office, which has happened, um, and we think there's something happening, I can type their name into the system. You know, the most basic level, it would say, call Christina Pacheco. And, and we can connect into the person that's working with that individual. But what it's really doing is integrating our operations so we can more completely support the individual because we're finding that there's just gaps <coughs> in the system. And then as we talk to the county, because they're on the same system and, and really working on data sharing is how we all start really working and supporting the individual um, as we look forward. So that's a five minute example of we could probably talk about for hours in terms of the nuances of everything we're having to deal with. Carol. And Zach, I want to tell you that core program. Yeah, we'll let that with the law enforcement has been outstanding. With uh, John has done a great job in connecting us all, and we're piloting that because we're really working hard to keep. We don't want kids getting into the uh, criminal justice system. Yeah, so I can't take credit for it. It's the staff that does an amazing job. And one of the big things is, as the superintendent said, is tearing down the walls within the city of Lamont so that Christine Pacheco and her staff and we're working across the city as wide to try to find the resources. And one of the challenges I set forth was the goal is to keep the kids in the school because once they get out of the school, then they're my problem on the street. And so how do we address that within the schools? And, uh, I met the superintendent probably mid-year, and we started a pilot program for the last three months of the school where we assigned a clinician from our core team um, and an extra SRO and made some changes on staffing. Um, I'm waiting for a final kind of assessment of that. Uh, but the preliminary information was it worked fantastic. It was only for the Longmont schools, but we were able to send that clinician and send that officer um, to, to work with students who were having some type of crisis or in the situation. But then we were also able to connect the parents outside of the school, so additional resources within our community. Um, and so we're looking to continue that program, hopefully, as we move forward. The ring light program that Harold talked about is really the brainchild of John Garcia, and most of you, I'm sure, are pretty uh, familiar with him. And the idea was, how do we begin to create a program that, in its essence, is a pre-file program, meaning that we can take a felony, we can take a misdemeanor. We started in our schools, uh, I think the year before last, and our SROs were, were funneling uh, the kids to the program. Christina is, is involved in that program, uh, along with the judge, along with uh, LCJP. And the idea is to bring those in. Uh, the kids are evaluated. You guys, please correct me if I'm wrong, because they deal with a lot more than I do. But it's giving, identifying what the need of the individual is, giving them the resources and needs to make better decisions, or educating them, or giving them the mental health treatment, or substance abuse treatment, um, and then giving them the opportunity to learn from their mistakes. And so I know I've simplified it. If well, I said part it all, please, please correct me. Part of Rewind, it actually, we started this here before Zach was even here, is what we, we did is we went through and did some program evaluations on uh, Longmont Community Justice Partnership and some other things. And what, what we really started seeing from the data is that the referrals into the LCJP process weren't really matching the data that we were seeing. And, and we found that there was a gap in this. And, and part of that gap is what we were seeing is um, young men and women in, in our community had other issues. And the other issues could have been substance abuse issues, could have been broader family issues, could have been met mental health issues. And in a lot of those occasions, that wasn't necessarily qualifying them to go into the traditional community justice program because there's a point where you have to accept responsibility for whatever it is that you've done and to get through that program. And, and these individuals weren't ready to accept responsibility because of any number of challenges that were surrounding them. The goal of the Rewind program is to deal with those issues so we can work them through those processes and then take them to where they can accept responsibility and then move into that restorative justice process. Is that it in a nutshell? Yeah, yeah, we're really using restorative justice as an intervention. Um, and uh, really, I think the beauty of this program is it brings the clinical expertise that um, Children, Youth, and Families has, um, along with the uh, expertise that we have in our municipal courts um, on, the, on the court side of things. Um, and as Zach mentioned, um, 
how we partner with our uh, frontline officers, school resource officers to do that. And so um, that, I think we started building the program in 2018 was when we rolled out that, um, that pilot um, and have uh, some really good outcomes from there, thanks to the, thanks to the, the yeah. broader team. You know, Mayor, Christina has been a long time support for our students and you've done amazing work. And so, I don't know if you're gonna hear me, but a big thank you to you. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about is doing everything we can to keep kids from going down that pathway outside of school. And we have had kids go through the Rewind program. We also have, thanks to our online school, uh, when a kid does something that's pretty serious that we might otherwise require expulsion, we've been able to defer that and keep them in school and have them demonstrate that they're ready to come back in without breaking stride towards graduation and then they don't get caught up in the criminal justice system and they keep on their track and we've had some great success with that. Yeah, and, and I just wanted the last comment that we'll make is one of the things we started about two years ago is we actually track every interaction with every student that's in online school, positive and negative. And so we track the data from gender, how the report was made, everything. We've met over the last uh, probably almost three years with other different organizations. And some have been opposed to the SROs being in the schools, and of course, superintendent has been a, a huge supporter of that. But we're able to show them real time data, real time information, and, and they have walked away from the meeting going, hey, how can we share this across you know, Colorado? And we're happy to meet with folks. We've met with different agencies and different district attorney's offices and different cities to share this information. But it, it really is a testimony to show that the data that we have really shows, I think last year we made one arrest in the entire, with all of our contacts, one arrest. Most of the stuff is getting sent other places, but again, if you ever need that as a school board, you need that information, and we're happy to share that data with you. Uh, if you begin to get questions like, why are SROs in our school, what's going on? We're happy to share that data real time with you based on uh, pretty much anything you can think of, we break it down in this app that each SRO fills out for any contact they have with positive interaction or, or what we would call negative interaction. Yeah, I think I'd say one thing when we talk about community safety, um, the biggest challenge we have right now is this. Mm -hmm. um, because historically what you would see is there was a point where you could see things and you could respond to what you see. What we're finding now is that so much of what's occurring actually is via different social media platforms. And then the next thing you know what you do, when we do see it, it, it's at a different level. Because it's just been bubbling in the social media world. And I know we spent some time talking to folks about how do we get into that. And, and as a parent of former teenagers, you know, the only way you can do it is you, you have to be on top of their access, see it, be engaged in it, and deal with it. But I think that's probably our biggest, this is probably our biggest challenge right now is that the world has shifted dramatically in terms of where things start and, and where they go before you see the explosion. And um, Yeah, I think to, to your point, typically, when I was in high school, I'm old, right? You hear about a fight that was going to happen from the trophy case or in the cafeteria and everybody would show up. Um, and so you knew that it was going to happen and now what we see is it boils up on social media and then we find our youth are now out in our community doing things and shooting each other. And, it's not just a simple, let's fight at the Dairy Queen at the football game, and, you know, call it a night. It's, it's really bubbled into more uh, to Harold's point, and that's really the, what we're trying to combat outside of the schools is, is what's happening and taking place on social media. So I think to that point, what are we doing? So obviously, from a broader community perspective program, um, we started a, a program with Project NOLA. We're now getting ready to shift it into... Um, a different video management system. So we use call volumes to really determine where do we put cameras at certain locations within our community. Um, preliminary data is telling us um, one part, for example, the calls for service were reduced by 60%. Um, and so we're starting to see that as we, as we place it. You know, we've talked publicly about uh, the use of um, block cameras uh, within our community, and we have a couple. We have four or so installed, ten more, five, five, ten more coming. What that lets us do is, as things start occurring within the community, we're able to see it much, much faster. Um, and in seeing it much faster, it lets us resolve it. 
in a very short period of time. Um, and I can't get into details on this, but there's been a number of situations that we've had to deal with that historically would have taken months, if not a year, in terms of working through and, and getting all the information. They, we've actually been able to move through them within 24, 48 hours. And so utilizing technology in the broader community perspective is, is showing itself um, in terms of how we deal with these issues. The other thing that it's doing is it's really kind of ticking off. Um, it's creating, we have productivity improvement because we're not getting as many officers involved for as long a period of time, which is resulting in a cost avoidance in the future in terms of potentially having to hire even more. Um, and it's reducing our costs immediately because we don't have the ongoing overtime expenses that we have. So um, really taking that smart city approach, which is tying in then with next slide and some other things that we're doing in terms of working that more globally, but it really is directly going at community safety. Can I just share a quick Thank you. Um, I am the lead district person that works with the core team because of my job, and it has truly been a blessing this year of the work that they've been able to do in our schools because I, thinking about productivity, I spend most of my day working in true mental health with students with problem solving. The state of Colorado has closed a huge number of schools that we used to use, which has given us the opportunity, which is what I've always wanted to do, is keep it here which is in Longmont, um, right downtown. But if we didn't have the partnership with CORE, I don't think we'd be as good at our jobs um, and being able to like forward think of like, how do we solve this? Because they can take care of the weekend stuff. And every Monday morning we meet and we say, where did you go this weekend? And what did you do? And we have a great conversation. And then sometimes it's 15 <coughs> minutes and sometimes it's a little bit longer or if they're needed in a bigger capacity with something else going on or they recognize something in a family, we've been able to truly address it in a great partnership this year. Barry, like nothing else we've been able to do. Ari, when you say schools, you're talking about <coughs> private facilities. Yes, the private facilities. Our school, not our school district. Not our school But um, so many across the state, all the superintendents have been talking about so many of the private facilities have closed and that overwhelms schools. Both in numbers and in severity of the, the challenge. And thank you for that. And this council uh, has supported the core program, and we've actually had four teams. Unfortunately, two staffing, <laughs> the staff, unfortunately, we only have two fully staffed out. Uh, we are moving forward with some hiring, uh, but it is. But we are also seeing some challenges with the youth and juveniles uh, where there is no mental health facilities or treatment for them. To where they're staying in hospitals for months at a time, and, and that is creating. A problem for us, and so that is something that we're trying to work with our mental health partners to try to figure out what do we do with individuals that can't be placed, but yet we have nowhere for them to go, and so they're spending literally months within hospitals until there is an open bed or location. For them to go. And we would welcome the opportunity to keep being a part of that conversation right. because their education, while they are here, is still our responsibility. Okay. And so we're happy to dive into it. I've, this is our work, and so we are. Most of the students that have been in that situation actually fall under me. Okay, so I'll keep that in mind. I'll yep. talk to Andy. We have, but we do appreciate court. So thank you for the work Absolutely. that you have done. Johnny is one of our assistant superintendents, and he oversees all of student services. And I don't know, Johnny, you spend a lot of your time in support of our children. So yeah, I don't, I don't think I can add much other than this this concept of connecting our kids to their people and their purpose. And that's huge, and not to devalue or undervalue the significance of SROs, nurses. Um, Don mentioned uh, counselors and interventionists. We have well over 150 counselors, interventionists, licensed clinical social workers, social workers that work in our, that work in our system. And so it's important to understand that they are significant and important, but equally important and significant is the after school programming that we provide, them being involved in extracurricular activities, them being able to have a place to go to after hours when school is not in session, on the weekend when school is not in session. And so that is huge. Um, I don't think there's a, um, a big mystery of why we see graduation rates continue to, uh, to continue to go up as we see programming and uh, opportunities that we provide to our students outside of the school day. 
and just having that balanced approach, that understanding that when we talk about mental health, when we talk about safety, those are equally as important uh, for students to be able to go to a facility that they're proud of in their community, right? Like the, um, we've been working, starting uh, um, to work with uh, the city of Albany and their youth center, and then being able to go to a, a facility and they're like, wow, I can hang out here. That's, that's, that's significant, that's important. Um, when they come to school, they get proud about how the school looks like and what it feels like. And, and so all of those things are significant and important and lead to uh, students having you know, positive outcomes as it relates to mental health and safety. Um, I traditionally come from an area where uh, safety has, been a, has always been a major concern in South Central Los Angeles, but the Taj Mahal of those, uh, of those communities is the Boys and Girls Club, right? Um, um, the Urban League and the facilities are through the roof. And so, um, so you know, not to discount that uh, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination, we're working towards that. And also I would mention that the partnerships that we have are through CORE and then also uh, BTAG, there's an organization that we're a part of that's the Border Threat Assessment Group where law enforcement is uh, uh, partnering with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and also school districts to really assess not just safety as it relates to students and kids, but also community members. And so we're talking with each other consistently. We have that meeting every couple of weeks. And then we also have a meeting with, um, um, with the youth center um, and the old program with Rewind, all of those players are, we meet on a monthly basis and we sit down and have conversations about what you're seeing, what level of support are we providing students. So at least in the last six years that I've been here, you're seeing us having more and more conversations, communications around safety and mental health from a comprehensive standpoint, not just referring a student to a, an outside counselor. Uh, so it's much more than just, if that was the case, we'd have you know, counselors and, you know, mental health folks and psychologists and psychiatrists all around, but we know it's much more complicated. I'm glad to hear those conversations happen. So as you can see, this is an ongoing, we can talk about it for hours and hours, but it's really, uh, the partnership is, is incredibly important. And uh, I want to thank both city. And I want to open it up now to questions. When you have a question, um, if you could direct it to either the uh, superintendent or city manager, that I think would make it easier for response. So, Councilor Yarbrough. Well, my question wasn't for either one of them. Oh, <laughs> well then, I'll call you. Okay. Well, no, I just wanted to make sure, I, I, all of this information that's being shared is really, really good information and it makes me happy, but I also want to make sure that our youth and um, youth services back there, Hilda and Christina, is there anything that you want to say about the partnership or are there any disparities or anything you want to lift up or I just want to make sure that I hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that definitely the partnership is um, amazing. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, Superintendent Haddad talk about um, RIP. I know that that um, has been something that Hilda and her team at the Youth Center have been working on as far as, um, you know, just making sure that uh, the curriculum that we have addresses the needs um, that, that we uh, are seeing. And so I'm really encouraged that, you know, we're, we're looking at that and, and looking at um, how to continue that partnership. Um, Ben Reddy uh, is uh, our community coordinator that oversees that area uh, after we retired. And so I know many of you know Ben well. Um, and so we're really uh, happy to have him back at the city um, um, doing this work. Um, Anything that you want to add? Yeah, just in addition to, to that, that group piece, um, there's been some work to really look at that program and partner with the teachers and so that program has now been shortened to four uh, four days instead of what it was um, there really is this focus on um, on the level of development and so when we're going into and we're, we've, what we've done is we've hit those transition periods so we're working with um, 
um, our sixth graders um, that are heading into junior high and um, looking at talking about bullying, talking about um, to, you know their their development, how it is that you create empathy, how it is that you create very much like the uh, sources of strength that you do, and really just kind of reiterating that at that level and then once we get into high school that's when we start having those conversations about gangs because this is where the kids are now starting to see it and in that transition between middle school and high school so I want to just make sure that you understand that you know when we do go in and we talk about group that all of that is very developmentally appropriate and really what it looks like at that elementary level is what does it look like to um, make healthy decisions and you know when there's peer pressure how do you choose good friends and oftentimes you know what Lou would hear when he would go in and, and do these classes is um, that kids actually knew much more than than we even thought that they knew and so how we tread that lightly and, and how we uh, really reframe that to it's about making healthy decisions um, and uh, choosing your your peer group well and um, really starting that, that support at that one thing. You know, one, one, oh, I'm sorry. No. I was just going to say, you know, one other thing that we have found back to that peer group conversation is when the students during the pandemic yes, were separated from their support systems, not fully, but considerably in our school, what we found is kids from other communities outside of St. Brain, as far, you know, South is Colorado Springs, and as far north as <coughs> Fort Collins and Greek, we're all connecting and yep. mm -hmm. to your social media mm -hmm. point. Yeah. And those relationships, we would see kids coming into our system that didn't live in our community and doing things out in the community. And the other challenge we, we've seen is, in some instances, more often than we would like, the parents are in support of the behavior and are actually involved in the behavior with their child. And that becomes a very, and I've sat in on meetings and I've been privy to conversations that have been very difficult because we're fighting an uphill battle when their parents are in support of the behaviors that they're doing. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about parents across the board, most parents are outstanding. But when we have enough that it's problematic. And so I appreciate the work that you're doing and the sensitivity around the work. Because that's it's a, the reason it's a we take that multi-generational approach. And so we're working with, not only are we working with the youth, but we're working with their families as well. And we're engaging the parents, and we're having those meetings, and we're having those conversations. We have a robust um, uh, partnership with Zach and his team and the SROs. And so we're getting referrals from the youth and then reaching out to the parents and having those conversations and having those sit-downs. And so it's because you're, you're right, kids don't operate in silo, they are in the system, and so, you know, as much as you're part of that system, we're part of the system, and so are their parents, and so if we don't engage the whole system, then it's, it's, it's gonna be almost, almost virtually impossible to eliminate what it is that we're seeing. I think just to add one more thing, um, you know, uh, one of the things that you mentioned, um, Superintendent, is that you have about 80% of your kids that are engaging after school. Um, and I think that there's some opportunities for us to look at the 20% that aren't engaging and how we might be able to provide those, um, those uh, support systems, um, whether it's you know, through, the, through the youth center, through parenting classes. Um, I think that there's some opportunity to Council Member Yarbrough's point um, about how we might work on engaging the, the other 20 20 percent. Um, you know, so I, we were just having a conversation with um, Council Member Adalgo Ferry um, and our library director about how do we get kids signed up early um, with the library and provide those resources and really tacking, looking at that holistic approach to supporting them. And um, along those lines, I, I want to just give a very public thank you for the support for the Life Skills Fair event um, that we did in March. Um, that was a, just a great first step in engaging uh, youth from all across the city um, to learn some of those basic skills that they're going to be needing, and you know, just as they as they age and as they get older. 
Um, and very much looking forward to continuing to do this work together. And as I'm, I'm listening to you all, you know, talk about the apprenticeships and the internships, um, I think there might be some areas to explore there as far as partnering and bringing in youth and really raising awareness around um, opportunities that they that are open and available to them. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, to open it up for questions. Um, this was a huge topic, and we have um, three more uh, agenda items to go through. So, Councilor Hidalgo for it. And is, is there anyone else that wanted to speak to the topic before I do, because I already spoke? Okay. So, so I was one of the people who, who add, yes. asked to add this to the agenda. And um, a couple of things. So one, you know, as I heard, the core we have a core steering committee, and I don't know, and I I meet I'm part of that committee. I'm the person with lived experience, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and I don't think we have a St. Brain representative on there. We do meet quarterly, and this would be a great opportunity to to have. You know, we cover a lot of topic and looking at how to strengthen the program and keep it um, sustainable as well as what and addressing the core needs. So we have folks from the hospital, from um, from the county. Um, yeah, so you know if there's an opportunity to, to loop you into that. And I remember speaking with Mike Butler in the early days of I think it was like 2014, 2015, 2016 when we were um, you know going through stuff with my own daughter um, with suicide and um, and you know, really talking about and having, you know, as, he, as he's conceptualizing this and um, talking about what it's like to be a parent and trying to navigate the mental health system, and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. And so I am part of the um, Mental Health Colorado, and we do meet monthly. And um, you know, just looking at, at the gaps and, and what legislation should we be advocating for and moving forward. And um, you know, I had opportunity to write letters and testify to get um, key mental health legislation passed. But that's just one piece, one component of it. And so for me, my focus is really addressing that 20% or even that 0.6. You know, you know, I look at that 0.6 and I was like, well, you know, is that my son and his friends? I, um, you know, and as we're trying to to navigate and and really take care of the kids who are falling through the cracks, who you know, maybe cannot sustain concurrent enrollment in front range in order to do um, career tech and have those opportunities, but really addressing the kids who are disengaged and how to, how to re-engage them. And um, you know, one of the things that you know, is working with our children's youth and families, and, and they've helped you know, get out and with certain communities like Countryside Village and having a, a family meeting. I mean, I've had parents reach out to me who are just, they don't know what to do. They're young parents, they just don't have the skill set. And so it's not necessarily that the parents are approve of that, but they just don't know how to navigate and how to, how to get their kids going in, a, in the right track. And you know, I've done a lot of, of home visits with a lot of folks, especially at Countryside Village. So, um, you know, looking at how we can address those kids that don't are not engaged in sports and who go home and there's no adult around. Um, one of the things you know that I've had conversations with Hilda about is you know possibly having a satellite youth center out there and looking at what kind of transportation. And so really focusing on helping the kids get to these spaces. So even if it's not necessarily a satellite, we don't have the, the capacity to do a satellite youth center in different parts of the town, but how could we provide transportation to get the kids to the youth center? And, and so they're having positive experiences that are outside of the school system. I know some of the issues that my daughter had was she was in the school and she's hanging around the same friends, she has the same garbage but then when she's in an outside, when she was engaged with arts clubs or, or ballet outside of school, she was able to kind of re-image herself and, and build, strengthen relationships outside of that norm. And so she, that, that was something that helped empower her. So what, can, what kinds of things could we do in collaboration 
to help empower some of our kids who are just not making it in the, in the regular classroom setting and have opportunities to meet new kids and um, and have positive adult mentorship. So that's kind of what we were, <laughs> we were talking to. So if there's ways that we can, can work together on that, I would love to, I to have that opportunity. Susie, um, we didn't get what organization you're in that you wanted a St. Brain member on. Oh, so, I'm sorry. I thought I said it. The you same did. Thing. I the core did. Steering, core team steering committee. Core, so okay. it's Emily Van Van Dorn. Okay. Um, who who leads it? So you would like a St. Brain? Well, if uh, if somebody from St. Brain is interested, I think okay. you know having your voice on there would be very powerful. All right. Very insightful. Since you know, a lot of the Susie, calls of the for things, service are. One of the things I'll share with you is you know, I appreciate the focus being on the 0 0.6, but I want you to know is that was 7 and 8% mm -hmm. not too long ago. Yeah. And so our focus is the same, mm -hmm. but we don't want, and we also know that the graduation rate used to be at 55% mm -hmm. for our most at-risk students. It's almost at 90%. So I don't want there to be any confusion about where our focus is. Yeah. We're very interested in where your focus is. Mm -hmm. Because I think that 0 0.6 that you're talking about, if you can help us identify where they are, mm -hmm. because the reality is they don't come to school. No. And we don't have any contact with them. But you might through, you know, through uh, whatever mailings go out or addresses you have. Like when you talk to those parents that you mm -hmm. say you talk to, if you could bring them to us, mm -hmm. then we can help them. But I want you to hear clearly that even from last year, last year our, our graduation rate's going up by another percent. And when we talk about the 80% that are involved, mm -hmm. it used to be 60%, 58%. So I don't want you to not focus on the 0 0.6. Mm -hmm. I also don't want you to discount the 20% that we have put back on yeah, track. And I think that that's important, and I don't think that's your intention, uh -huh. but I think we have to communicate that we understand just how much has gone into doing what we've done, mm -hmm. and not simply say, well, now you're at 80%, but I'm only concerned about the 20, because that 20 yeah. used to be 40 and 50. And, and that's where we can really use your help, mm -hmm. is to let us know how you can help us fund these programs, mm -hmm. and let us know how you can help us with transportation, and let us know how you can help us with facilities. Harold's been great, and we're trying to work on that aspect of it. But and the other thing is, is you know, I, I, I think that there are a lot of kids who don't experience garbage in our schools. Mm -hmm. They experience wonderful things, and they succeed at a very high level. And so I don't want to paint the picture that our kids are engaging in garbage in our schools. No, no and that's not my intent. My intent is really filling the gaps, looking at what are some of the barriers and, and helping in that regard. And I think my focus is the 20%, um, you know, the ones that are disengaged. And, you know, and really looking at what can we do to enhance and make better. And, and so that's, are, that's always what, what I'm looking for. Some of them are working. Mm -hmm. Some of them are at home taking care of their children. So I don't want you to feel like all 20% no, no. in co-curricular are disengaged. But there's, there's clearly work to be done, and we have shared with you all of the things we're trying to do, and so I think this would be a great time for you to share some of the things that you're doing so that we can help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are the programs and initiatives that you're engaging in that we can come to the table? So I think that that would be a good conversation <laughs> to have offline, sure, sure. because we are getting But I, Yeah, I think, you know, children's youth and families. Exactly. And even bring it to council on yeah, how we can council, yeah. work. Uh, I hear a pre-session in that conversation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, and uh, I Karen just have a comment on the topic as well. Mm -hmm. um, our general counsel, Tim, brought up a story about what his mom told him about expectations. And mm -hmm. we set the bar very, very high for our students, and they're achieving. They're meeting our expectations mm -hmm. in the most ways. And I think in a blanket statement, we can say that addressing some of these issues that we're talking about is is done through raising our graduation requirements, raising our expectations, expecting our students to 
participate and and be part of the community, the St. Brain community, whether it's Longmont, me, Firestone, Frederick, Erie, each are unique, but it's this district that unites a very, very tight community. And when we see our numbers that Don stated earlier um, about graduation and dropout, and um, I, I would, I would not be surprised if we had a really um, significant uh, statistic in in a low in lower than that you know twenty percent. If we know in our country there's always going to be a certain percentage of mental health and statistically, but you know when we have things going on in partnerships that we all talked about tonight um, for our students and for our community. We're, we're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So while again, focus so important on, on those in a, in a greater way, we can just keep raising the bar, we can just keep these expectations high of ourselves mm -hmm. as leaders in this community and for our students. Okay. Uh, are there any other fast comments or questions <laughs> for about mental health? If not, let's move on to housing, uh, the housing update because I know that uh, yeah. we have a lot of info. Yeah, a lot of it. So um, I think generally when we talk about all the issues, the thing that probably is the undercurrent in, in this conversation is housing costs. Um, so when we look at housing, um, in March of last year, when we talked about Longmont, uh, the average sales price was $663,000. Um, that's just over $90,000 more, uh, and these are houses that sold in March on the March, just to give you some perspective. Um, that's about $90,000 more than Carmen Valley, um, and older number, uh, the average sales price is $1.5 million. Um, and so when we look at house pr housing prices in terms of how they've escalated, uh, and you talk about affordable housing, capital A, which means that it's federally subsidized. Um, and you talk about attainable housing, which is workforce housing, so that's about 80 to 120% AMI. 120% AMI is $663,000 uh, in, in long life. That's the average. And, and the important part is understanding what's happening on both sides of that, because we're also seeing that Houses that are selling below the average tend to be purchased, let's say, at four hundred thousand dollars. But people are purchasing those homes and then putting two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars of investment into it. And so, what you're seeing is houses cycling out of that. So, um, when we talk about attainable, affordable housing, capital A, just uh, and this is more associated with the housing authority. Um, we're looking at fifty percent AMI below. Historically, the housing authority built primarily age-restricted units, and so that is typically 55 and older. We only have one family unit that was built, and so we have about 475 units that we manage um, in terms of actual units. Uh, we also have around today probably 410 vouchers that we manage, and so those are housing choice vouchers. Um, that number, while the dollar amount is being increased by HUD, is actually increasing, decreasing in the number of vouchers that we can provide because the rental rates are going up. And, and so we received an additional million dollars from HUD this year for housing choice vouchers, but we're actually having to reduce the number of vouchers because of the rental rates in the community. So when you think about housing, that kind of puts it in perspective. Um, housing has been the council's uh, a big priority for this this council and the council before um, and we set a goal to build um, six additional housing units in five years uh, we have one which is is not age restricted that we partnered on which is the we call it the Christman development that's the new units that are being built in North Main uh, those are being leased up and, and that's a different project because they're doing income averaging under the low-income housing tax credit model so that does include some 70 and 80 percent AMI units. Those have been completely leased up uh, based on the information that I'm getting. Um, we're in construction on another 55 permanent supportive housing units adjacent to the suites. That again, permanent supportive is really transitioning those that are near homelessness or 
our homeless into a housing model. Uh, and that's an additional 55 units, so we'll be at about 130 units of permanent supportive housing. We've got another housing project that um, we're in the development stages on, um, which is a SENT a project on North Hover. Um, this is probably the first um, significant family housing that we're building, so that's going to be one through four bedroom units but we're also including early child care as a part of that project and we'll, we'll be partnering with Wild Plum in terms of providing early child care for the residents that live at, at that housing model. Um, uh, the Colorado Health Foundation gave us uh, $2 million for that component so we're, and that's a model that we're looking at. So we have that in development in terms of uh, affordable housing and we have about four more projects that are in the pipeline on the capital A affordable housing. You have to work through the LIHTC model and so Longmont's been pretty fortunate where over the last three cycles we've been awarded project and so the state actually has to balance that out so um, we think we have a good chance for one more that'll be the Atwood project and again not age restricted it'll be one and two bedrooms that we have there. Um, the city council has put a million dollars a year into an affordable housing fund that helps support uh, the development of affordable housing. Um, and then in terms of looking at the workforce housing, um, the attainable housing, which is 80 to 120% AMI, uh, we're in the process of putting another million dollars a year toward that. And then in addition to, to those two funding sources, we have a million that we're putting in, but it's 650,000 of ongoing funds, and then we finish the million dollar gap with one fund. Uh, in addition to that, we have the inclusionary housing program that I think this year Joni's bringing in around $3 million. And so what we do is we're, we're using that money to leverage private money and, and different state and federal dollars in order to create um, the housing. So if, if you think of those three projects, um, they're probably in the, or the four projects, they're in the neighborhood, let's say $60 million. So for a million dollars in this project and a million dollars in this, um, you know, we're probably leveraging $240 million of investment in terms of housing that we're bringing into our community. Um, on the attainable side, uh, so we've created the attainable housing fund, the council, uh, we have our first project that's moving forward, and so that's going to be 185 for sale units, uh, of which uh, 55 of those units are going to be uh, permanently de deed restricted affordable units. So when you think about sales prices on that, think of 300 to 350 for perspective. Um, and I'm using wide ranges because um, the AMIs change in terms of what we're looking at. The other 135 units will be uh, for sale attainable housing units. Um, there are other communities that are doing projects like this. I don't think there's one this large um, in Colorado in terms of everything is attainable or affordable. What we realized is um, affordable for sale housing, the subsidies are, are significant. So typically, even if you look at the Habitat for Humanity model, it costs them about $400,000 to build the house, and they're selling it for $300,000. We're seeing that in our project as well, in terms of what we're having to do uh, for uh, affordable housing. Even attainable, there's, there's some subsidies there. You're going, what's driving the cost? Um, first and foremost, it's land cost. Uh, land cost is really the first thing that starts tipping the housing price over and I think that's why you see the difference between the cost of housing in Longmont versus Carbon Valley is land's, land's less expensive um, east of here. Um, when, when you then look at that, the next piece that comes in is actually construction materials and everything that goes into the home. And so we have built a really good model on this project that council approved the development agreement on. We just went through zoning. And so it was an open book process and understanding what are the cost drivers. Um, in order to do this, we actually had to get really aggressive in terms of the holding costs. And so we're looking at probably it has to sell within 90 days. Um, 
in, in terms of doing this, so we're, we're really working the issues to manage it. Uh, one of the things that we did, and this is part of the agreement, is because the city is putting in with federal funds that we received and state funds that we received, plus fee waivers, plus cash, um, it's about 12 to 13 million dollars into this project. So we're taking the total project costs, figuring out what the percentage of city investment is. And so there's a, um, a preference then for individuals on, I think it's around 10% of the cost um, for city employees. Uh, there's then a preference for people who work in Longmont or who are retired in Longmont for the other units. Uh, frankly, as we develop this project, we're actually planning to conduct a lottery um, to um, look at how we sell those homes because we think the demand is going to be so great that we think a lottery approach is probably going to be the best way to move forward. Uh, and so we think we've defined the model. Uh, building attainable housing is much easier. So if we were to come in and do an attainable housing project, we think um, if we could get reduced land costs on that um, and fee waivers, that the margins are pretty narrow on attainable housing, 80 to 120. The more affordable housing you put into that, the more the, the margins start separating in terms of, of what you need to do to incentivize it. Um, the attainable housing units, um, we figured out a deed restriction, we call it a rolling deed restriction. So if somebody lives in the house 10 years, they can sell the house and then they have market value coming out of it. If you sell the house within 10 years, then whomever buys it gets another 10 year deed restriction. Um, the data is really telling us it's common. So for individuals, most people live in a house about six and a half years and then they sell it. So what we're doing is, is cycling this demon in terms of preserving that housing stock. If somebody has to get out of the house at year eight, nine, or seven, eight, or nine, they can sell the house. If they can't find somebody to buy it within that AMI range, they can sell it for market value, but then they have to pay us a percentage of the equity back in terms of getting that house at a lower price. Right, so, um, this is a, um, a program that we think we've, we've got a sense of the model and what that's really going to look like. And um, we had a really good, it's a really good public private partnership. Uh, the landowner, to give you a perspective, sold us the land for the affordable housing piece at $3.65 a square foot. That was part of the Costco deal. Um, and then they sold us the property for the attainable at ten dollars a square foot uh, market value for land without water conditions being met is about 18 to 19 dollars a square foot and that was about a year ago so i assume it's about 20 to 21 dollars a square foot when you factor water into that the value can be anywhere from 23 to 30 dollars a square foot so you see the difference that land really makes in terms of being able to build build these housing units we couldn't purchase the property and done this project. So we're talking to other folks about how we replicate this um, and, and continue moving it forward. So, you know, when you look at the numbers, we have about five or 600 housing units that, from affordable to attainable that are going to be coming online um, in the next two to three years. And uh, we're continuing to develop other projects, looking at Prop 123 funds, the legislature is also really focused in terms of the transportation project and rail. They've really shifted um, funding for housing into transit-oriented development. So we're starting to really look at our downtown core and what that looks like and what's available from a funding perspective. So that's a quick update on housing. That's a lot. <laughs> but we're moving along fast. And, um, the part that has always really excited me is the part that Harold just uh, described with the land that we purchased from Costco and that the land was there, which as he said is the biggest part. So anytime there is an organization uh, that, that has land and wants to, to have their teachers or nurses or be able to live and work in the uh, city, I think that we can figure out a way to partner with them to build that housing. Um, but this is kind of a pilot project for us. 
So to see how that works and if it, if it does work the way I hope it does in keeping our employees within the city, then it, it's a win-win for us. So. And I think our perspective when we talk about community safety and we talk about, you know, we talk about all these issues, the most important piece to that is actually housing mm -hmm. because housing stability is important in terms of keeping people moving through the various programs that we're doing because we know when you take away that housing stability, it sends a shockwave through the family and everyone involved. And so that's really kind of from the housing program what we're also focusing on because, um, you know, you can look at 10 years worth of data and find out that housing stability is kind of the foundation to everything in terms of success. So, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think it's great and it's wonderful to eliminate that challenge from people. It's very, very important. We're doing our part as far as salaries go. We're yeah. trying to, I think we have the highest base pay now in the state. We're going to continue to make strides there, but it's it's a challenge when you look at $663,000. That's a lot. You know, I remember the day when it was 350000 in long months for the average home. So yeah. thank you for the work you're doing. I have a real quick question. Uh, you didn't mention where the state's at on the MEHA program. So the state's developed a middle income housing program. We actually have one project that we're talking about that may come into Longmont. And uh, again, that is um, on the rental side. Market rate uh, for rent is 80% AMI. So um, and the state programs is a square peg round hole for Longmont because it's really built for Denver and the mountain communities. So it's a program that helps fund that attainable housing, that workforce housing, and it's um, income restricted workforce housing. And they're still in the process of developing that program. I think one of the challenges is it's a new governmental organization, and so issuing <coughs> is, is sort of something they're continuing to work for. Um, because um, the one thing about housing is the interest rates are really a key variable in terms of the construction cost and, and how you look at it. So it's continuing to develop. We're actually in conversations right now in terms of is there a way to replicate that but it's not a state program um, because I think having that local control is really important because the state ends up owning those properties and what they, how they divest of those properties is, is unclear right now. Uh, so that's part of what we're looking at in terms of the transit-oriented development in the downtown area, it, it, some options that I'm, I will be talking to council about in, in the next month or so. And uh, how do you want to address the governor's bill that he is signing uh, about that includes ADUs as part of the uh, yeah, so from a city perspective, you know, one of the things that housing advocates talk about is um, the ability to, to have an accessory dwelling unit on your property. Um, and if you look at a lot of the land use legislation that was brought forward um, over the last two sessions, um, it really is about um, trying to create more housing opportunities within communities. For Longmont, it's been a really interesting conversation because Joni and her planning group and the council approving it have done a really good job of establishing our codes that actually met everything that the state was saying. The reality is, is not every city is doing that. And, and so that's really the driver in terms of some of their land use legislation that they were pulling forward. So in Longmont, you can build an ADU under our code. The stopping point on the ADU was that the homeowners associations could prohibit the ADU from being created, even though the city code allowed that. Um, the legislation that passed actually will allow ADUs. Um, I'm looking at Joni to make sure, but homeowners associations don't have the ability to prohibit an ADU, I think, under that legislation. And I think that made it through yeah. the attack on the way. I think yes. that piece made it through. So that's another potential solution to housing is really accessory dwelling units and that could be separate and apart or it could be in someone's basement. You know, the question really is 
what's going to be the traction on that because again when you're looking at interest rates and other components there's other challenges but what we've done from a housing standpoint is we have designed stock ADU plans that people can utilize if, if they want to do that through our housing and community investment decision um, but we do think the next few years in terms of land use um, is going to continue to be a challenge for us at the, at the state level because um, it really is kind of some of these things kind of are starting to dig into home rule authority which is, is changing that for all communities and um, you know parking restrictions was another thing that they adjusted in terms of um, cities can't set maximums or can't cities can't set minimums for parking and transit oriented development areas um, and so there's a lot of changes that we're going to have to start really digesting in terms of what that means really is about you know housing is the driver in, term, in all of these conversations it looks like we've covered that one pretty well the next one is uh, library cards for high school students may um, I, if yes. I may yes just because we've some of us in the room have been together since 7 a.m. and it's okay. a long day I just wanted to invite you know employees or others that if you do need to leave you know we would respect that or and or if you wanted to continue conversations with any of these topics that you think might take um, more time than we, should, we might want to allow tonight then I would entertain that as well Thank you for that. I think that's a great suggestion. And it looks like the very last thing on our agenda we've already covered under yeah. mental health and community, um, the after school programs and uh, support for at risk youth. Sounds to me, do you agree that we probably covered that one pretty well? There's a couple there's a couple things that I think would be noteworthy on that. Okay. That, Let's uh, go with uh, Karen Raglan's suggestion that Anyone who feels that they would have heard enough, mm -hmm. know the subject matter pretty well, and have no questions, please feel free to to leave. No judgment. No judgment <laughs> <laughs> at all. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, a couple things that uh, we found some really good success with is after school our AAA program, and that is providing students with extra time after school focusing on reading writing and other things and we're providing the transportation and we're providing meals and so that takes them well beyond the, the school day and we've seen a lot of growth in reading and math scores and other things and that's a program that's very unique to St. Brain. The other thing is, is through the entire month of June we have extended the school year again through our project launch program four days a week with small class sizes and again we're providing transportation and we're providing meals and that you know these programs cost millions of dollars mm -hmm. so it's not like you just decide you're going to have school all through the month of june and you're going to have school and after school programming and then we start two weeks early in august with our jump start program again giving kids that jump start that they need and i think taking a lot of that time where kids are isolated and having them in school with all of these opportunities has really really helped and i think there's a piece in there also about uh, english as a second language and i don't know if Diane, if you want to share a little bit about because the results that you've experienced and our system has experienced with our children is pretty phenomenal yes and and um you know, thank you so much and it's been amazing to be able to to work here in Lama. it's so uh, such a vibrant city and you know I just wanted to share a little bit about our population we've seen in the news a lot of the newcomers and people coming to Colorado we've maintained pretty much the same rate of 11% uh, of our students here in St. Frank are English language learners so historically we really haven't seen uh, growth, but we definitely are seeing a shift in our students who are arriving. Many are older, more unaccompanied youth, or typically it would be families with students. So we're definitely seeing that. It connects with some of the conversations we've had with supporting 
a youth um, as they're uh, in their teenage years. But I want to say one of the things that's it's really profound, and it goes back to what Don's sharing about our graduation rates. Um, we we really have the highest uh, English learner graduation rate in the state of Colorado. In fact, um, you know, if you compare uh, the state in 2023, only 65% of the English language learners in the state of Colorado graduated um, in four years. And here in St. Rain, 83% of our, of our ELs um, graduate. It's truly a significant accomplishment. And um, I think through the professional development of our teachers, you know, the support of our principals, but also the family engagement. I think we've heard a lot of talking about how important it is to engage with our families. I really want to, you know, give a shout out to Claudia um, and also to uh, Jenny Diaz and Brittany as well. You know, they have helped us with our premarital um, first generation uh, youth leadership summit that we've had for a, a few years. And we talk a lot about providing each and every student with a strong competitive advantage. When we look at that data, we really talk about what what is significant. Yes, the outstanding teachers and staff. But also, we take a look at the bond money, where we significantly in downtown uh, Longmont really created some outstanding school facilities, um, which are just incredible. And then also our P-TECH programs. And when you talk to our families, um, and I've been here 10 years, and I was a City of Longmont resident myself, it is the families who want to know how their children can succeed. And our Cafecitos programs, uh, all the work through our PI programs that's really coming together with the city, the county, many of our nonprofits, supporting our Spanish speaking mainly uh, population here in Walmart uh, has truly been outstanding. We just can sit, we continue to see the family engagement grow and grow and grow. And they're advocating for their students to take advanced placement courses. They want their students to take the concurrent <coughs> courses. They want their students to engage in the PTEP, where they can get, you know, uh, just like our 53 students who graduated with uh, an associate's degree uh, two weeks before they graduated with the St. Vrain High School diploma. And so I, I think that um, I, mean just, I really want to thank the collaboration between all of us uh, because family engagement has made a significant uh, impact for English language learners. And we're going to only continue to see that graduation rate increase. Thank you. Yeah, Counselor Hidalgo. Yeah, so thank you. And you yeah. know, being a Title I yeah. teacher or in the school district, uh, I see that. So I have one of my newcomers from Columbia, yeah. came in last year, and speak a stitch of English. She's reading at third grade level this year. So you know, I was able to exit five students from read plans. And they're all um, linguistically diverse students, so it was—it's very exciting to see that. And you know, I attribute a lot of it to the training that's, that's afforded, and I take every opportunity I can to to um, to ex ex extend that that learning for me as an, an, an educator. And you know, and really, so I appreciate that. And you know, so there is a lot of good work happening. And I see when the kids are given that task. I know several of you here were part of or watching the um, when our students a couple of years ago who now graduated fifth grade did the sugar factory redesign and that was profound to them and you know even talking listening to them at their graduation for fifth grade remembering that experience and wanting to to look at city planning and you know look at, look at different departments and oh I want to do this or you know and of course when are you going to build it so <laughs> We're looking to, to get that um, remedied as well. And so that just having those opportunities for kids. And so I think the community engagement, you know, my involvement with PI, I've seen a lot of our Latinx families become leaders, just really become leaders and take ownership in their child's education. And so by having those continued operations, um, you know, those continued opportunities to, um, to be sustainable and, and come in place. Um, you know, and I want to look at, I want to make sure too that we're not duplicating. You know, so maybe we have an idea to do something in our end, then you all are doing something in your end, 
that we, we have that crossover and that interconnection so we can address the kids who need it, but as well as really look to enhance those kids who are, are wanting to move forward and the families that are, are ready to, to really take leadership roles in their communities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a few minutes for the library cards for our high school students? Yeah, I, yeah, and so that was, let me pull up my phone, because I have the MOU, and so it sounded like there is interest in, I know yeah. we had a former, and you were the one who signed it as I looked at the um, MOU from 2022. Yes, and uh, John and I were talking, like, if we need to do some work offline to look at that again. Yeah. So we sure can. Yeah, and no, I think that would be great, of, you know, looking at expanding that that access sure. for students, you know, like it's, I mean, I've, I've gifted every year several books to my students just because they don't even have books at all. Mm -hmm. So how can we help provide yeah, that access, especially looking to 21st century well, with a lot of digital media? Yeah, and I'll also point out, you know, we have a, a really robust here within our district mm -hmm. area, my on reading, yeah. which is tremendous. We have the nation's Sora. largest yeah, district mm -hmm. digital library, largest. Mm -hmm. And then if we partner with the, the Walmart library, it gave me more access to it. Yeah. So, I think John and I can work on that and, and see what we can work out with you. Thank you. That sounds great. That sounds great. And for a bit of trivia, you probably already know this, but I just learned it. Is that Longmont had the very first library in the state of Colorado? Oh, wow. yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Okay. So I win the trivia contest. <laughs> yeah, a lot of firsts. Yeah. So we actually got through the agenda and went over time. Thank everybody. And nobody left. Oh, yes. So, um, yes. Thank everybody. I love this. What I would like to hear next year, though, is what did we try that didn't work? And this all sounds wonderful, yeah. but nothing is perfect and nothing works all the time. So if we come together again next year, it would be really nice to hear what we tried and it didn't work. So we don't try it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are. Oh.